Well, greetings and welcome. We're here for another great uh, noise make, noise, Newsmakers interview series. I've been calling it Noisemakers for two weeks because we're making some noise here. Uh, the Newsmakers interview series with Dr. Marvin Olasky. And tonight our interviewee is Mr. Bob Beckel, columnist for the USA Today, an American political pundit, former political operative. He was an analyst on the Fox News Channel where he used to co-host The Five. At USA Today, he writes articles with his friend and political opposite Cal Thomas in the style of point counterpoint. His new book about his life entitled, I Should Be Dead, will be out November 3rd. Welcome with me, Bob Beckel. Okay, Bob, with a title like that, I Should Be Dead, yeah. I, I just gotta do it. I'm gonna run through all the times in the book that you say you should be dead. Well, let me see. Okay, I'm going to start number one. Well, number okay. one was when I, uh, at the beginning of the book, when I, uh, uh, I this was, uh, I'm sure it doesn't sit with the politics of everybody here, but I was, when George Bush got nominated and uh, approved by the Supreme Court the day before his inauguration, which was January 19th, uh, 2001, I uh, was at a bar in uh, Southern Maryland, a biker bar, and I was introducing myself to a lady at the bar, and uh, I was quite drunk. And I turned around, and there was a 45 caliber right in my face, like this. And the guy pulled the trigger, and it didn't go off because he hadn't chambered the first bullet. So somebody grabbed him from behind, and the second one blew a three-foot hole in the ceiling. So, and then they threw me into the parking lot. And I remember saying, I was not a believer then, I remember saying, God, if you exist, that's the last drink I'll ever have. And it was. That was uh, almost 15 years ago. So. Okay. Okay, so that's number one, uh, time you should be dead. Um, then let's, you know, we can take them in order in the book. You're, you're integrating a lunch counter. This is, goes way back to the late 60s in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Right. There are two other white guys. There are three black guys with you. You're trying to integrate the lunch counter. The local folks attacked. Good old boy grabbed yeah, an axe handle. And they, what uh, you know, there's something about being in the South when you were, I was in the second wave of, of civil rights activists going to the South to try to register voters. And, you know, those good old boys just didn't take to us coming from, particularly white people coming from the North. You know, first of all, they thought we were all Jewish, uh, which, which we weren't. Uh, but this one counter, the laws had already been passed and they were supposed to serve blacks. And so we picked out this one lunch counter in a Woolworths and uh, we went there and sat down, six of us. And this waitress with a bouffant hairdo, you know, chewing gum, uh, wouldn't pay any attention to us. So I took a salt shaker and I rolled it down the counter, at which point the door opens up and in comes about eight or nine uh, gentlemen, as it were, with ax handles. And they uh, beat the stuff out of us uh, badly. And I actually ended up uh, cracking the back of my skull and they wouldn't take me into a white hospital. So I ended up going to a black clinic. And fortunately, just fortunately, there was a black doctor there who happened to be a neurosurgeon. He was doing his rotation through there. And he patched me up and put plastic on the back of my skull where you could still feel the, the indentations. Um, and then we get to trial. These guys asked for a speedy trial. And you don't want to go to a trial in uh, the South in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, if you're against some of the local boys. But they went, they had videotape, they had eyewitnesses, they had everything they needed, gave the case in front of the jury. The jury went out, came back 10 minutes later, and they were not guilty, all of them. So they then sent us to the, the county line, to the, to the uh, Virginia line and let us go and said, we'll see you sometime, but don't come back here. So that was, uh, it was close. I mean, that one was, it was, uh, uh, I mean, I was knocked out, but I was, and I'd, I played football for a lot of years, so I was used to being knocked out, but not like that. That was a little tough. So you, you write that, uh, uh, quote, I was drunk, though it was only noon, and raged out at him, calling him a stupid pig and telling him his daughter was great in the sack. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that was probably not called for at the time. <laughs> See, my old man was, uh, my father was a civil rights worker, and he, uh, he worked with Dr. King for eight years, 
And my father was one of the few people who never bought into Dr. King's nonviolence idea. Uh -huh. So when he was at the bridge at Birmingham uh, and all the cops were coming down with dogs and horses and stuff, my father gets up and pulls one of the cops off the horse and then proceeded to get the hell beat out of him. But my father told me, the first introduction I had to civil rights work, my father was 14 years old and I wanted to play baseball for the summer. And my father said, no, I've got a better idea. Let's go to Meridian, Mississippi and register some voters. And I said, why do we want to do that? He said, oh, it's a good exercise for you. So we get on this bus in New York City. It's about half black, half white. We drive three days to Meridian. We pull into the bus stop and got attacked by this group of, of uh, necks. Uh, and they flipped the bus over. And we had to go out the back emergency room uh, door of the bus and into the coloreds only men's room, which was against the law then, too. At which point, the deputies proceeded to come in and beat the hell out of us with, with uh, tubes. And uh, I ended up in jail with all these adults. And my father had been arrested, I think, 40-some times in the South at that point. And the sheriffs used to call my mother and say, your husband's in jail, you want to bail him out? First three times, she said, yeah, I'll bail him out. After that, she said, let him stay. So this time, uh, the sheriff called and said, your husband's in jail, you want to bail him out? And she said, no. And he said, well, your son's with him. She said, I was worried about that. Uh, so she bailed us out. And I remember it was different. It was yesterday, walking down the courthouse steps and turning to my old man and saying, hey, Pop, how about next year we go to the beach? You know, <laughs> something normal, you know, that would make sense for an average person. Uh, but he was an activist all his life and, and uh, a drunk, a bad drunk. Uh, but I come from a long uh, line of drunks on both sides of the family. Uh, and uh, I got the bug, too. It's very unusual not to if you've got four generations on both sides. Uh, so uh, he never did uh, get over it. Um, he actually had, my, my father had uh, three brothers and a sister. All of them were Ivy League graduates. All of them were very accomplished, and all of them died drunk before they were 50, except for my father, who married a woman. He, he, he was teaching in high school in, in New Jersey on his last legs, and he, but he kept a hometown subscription to his newspaper, and he uh, read that the richest guy in Pennsylvania pretty much had died, and he knew the guy. So he went out to console the widow on a bus. He borrowed the money for me to get on the bus. And two months later, he was married to her. And she said, and they moved to Charlottesville, Virginia. And, and uh, she said, now, bud, you can drink one day a month. That's it. And any more than that, I got the money, you're out. So uh, he ended up living to be 90. So, you know, it's, uh, that means I've got some hope. Behind every live man, there's a good woman. That's right. So, um, Okay, so we've talked about two of the times that you should have been dead. Okay, then there's the time in Mexico yeah. that uh, you asked a woman if she wanted to have sex with you, and I guess it was her husband. And yeah, you go right down to the nitty gritty, don't you? I didn't even say that in the book. <laughs> Just but speculating. That was, that, was, that was the implication. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I used to. I went to to uh, Guadalajara. I live in Guadalajara, Mexico, because the draft was chasing me. And I'd flunk one draft physical because of high blood pressure, which was basically because of beer and amphetamines. Uh, let me off, and I, but I decided I had to get out of the country because they were going to come after me again. So I went to Guadalajara and, uh, to take Spanish classes. And good good I, thing to do. Yeah, it was, except I flunked out after the first week. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I used to take the trip from Guadalajara down to the, to the beach, about two and a half hours. And I'd always stop at this little cantina on the way down to drink some tequila. And I mean, that was strong tequila, right in the middle of tequila country. And uh, I was giving my thoughts about the world to this woman. Uh, and the next thing I know, her brother shows up with his friend. And they didn't take highly to that. Uh, so they pushed me out the back into a fenced-in area. I'll never forget it. There was a stack of wood in a fenced-in area. And the guy, they pushed me into the back, and the guy reaches behind the wood and pulls out a machete. Now, if I don't know if you've ever seen a machete coming at you, but it's one of the most frightening things. It's worse than an angry date. Uh, it, it, it just was paralyzed me. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, boys. Is there anything we can do here? And they didn't understand any English. I didn't understand Spanish. But I reached in my pocket, and I pulled out 60 bucks. And the guy stops, looks, says, okay, all right. We went back in, I gave him 60, and then he wanted 60 more for his friend. 
that was the best 120 bucks I ever spent. I mean, I got in that car, man, and I was gone. Uh, but, you know, those are the kind of things that, uh, and I thought to myself as I was driving away, you know, these guys could have killed me and taken the money if they wanted to. They're you honorable know? people. Yeah, but honorable people, and they, they cut an honorable deal. Yeah. Um, so uh, it was, uh, yeah, that one was very close. They were about two inches away from me when that happens. But, I mean, all this is, is uh, you want to keep going in my... Uh, I, I do, because uh, these are interesting stories, and we're just, we're just trying to lay out... Some of these are painful, the, you know. We're trying, a, well, you're, you're enjoying it, I think, in a way. We're, we're trying to lay out the case of how desperate your need for Christ was. Yeah, that's for sure. So, let me just... Uh, Peace Corps in Philippines. And again, this was partly... I mean, this, was, this sounds very altruistic, but as you wrote very honestly and graphically, I mean, you were still running away from the draft at that point. Yes, I was. And you tried, you, you kept trying to, you got your high blood pressure up again with a combination of drugs and other stuff. But here you're in the Philippines, and this, this is innocent on your part. There's a campaign rally, you say, and there are terrorists, and tell us what happens. Well, it was, uh, you know, I, I never, I, I fell in love with politics early in my life. Uh, when I was a, really a kid, my, the, the Nixon-Kennedy race came on, my father was watching, and I got fascinated by the whole idea that people go out to vote on one day and elect a president. So uh, in the Peace Corps, I was uh, sent to the sugar-growing area of, of uh, the Philippines, Bacola, and uh, there was a state senator, or, or, or a federal senator there named Zalonga, who I got to like a lot. And he was up for re-election, the last free election when uh, Ferdinand Marcos was mm. uh, then president of the Philippines. Uh, so the, our, our slate was called the United Slate. And there were six candidates for the Senate, and they were all on a, on a high rise in a place called Plaza Miranda in, in Manila, which holds about 200,000 people. The place was packed. Next thing you know, right as they were giving their speeches, guys stand up and start throwing hand grenades. And that, could, grenades that could ruin a rally. Yeah, it could. It, was, it made a lot of noise. Uh, and uh, they blew uh, my candidate's arm off with one of them. Uh, and, but the reason that I brought that into the book was because one of the hand grenades bounced off the stage and came right to my feet. And I thought, this is it. Goodbye and didn't go off. Uh, so that, and then the next day I was declared persona non grata and I was asked to leave the country uh, because they caught me in pictures and, and uh, we weren't supposed to be involved in politics, but uh, it was, uh, uh, that probably was the most fright, that and the gun, I think. Uh, and then, uh, but go ahead, you want to get into one of those stabs? Well, let's talk, let's talk about that, yes. Huh? Go ahead, yes, tell us about that. Well, uh, you probably wonder why I'm still here, uh, uh, not in several pieces. Sem uh, Semi-miraculous. Uh, somewhat, yeah. The nice thing about this was just to prove that all this happened was the publisher of my book ch fact-checked every bit of this, and he came back and said, you sure you want to put all this on the street? I said, mm -hmm. yeah, I do. It's all part of the cleansing process for me. Um, but I used to work with a homeless group in Washington and with my friend Bill, who was a... This is after I got sober, and Bill was a recovered heroin addict, and I was a recovering alcoholic, and we would take care of this homeless group. We lived underneath the highway in Washington, and every Thanksgiving we'd go to our sister's sister shelter in Baltimore or down to ours. Well, this one particular uh, Thanksgiving we went to Baltimore, and there's this one guy who lived under the highway named Charlie. He was about six seven, skinny as a rail and crazier than a loon. I mean, the guy had 15 personalities. He just was schizophrenic. He was everything that was in the, in the psychiatric books. Uh, so we get up to this thing, and the place is packed. It's got families. It's got, you know. And so Charlie all of a sudden stands up in the middle of this crowd and starts one of his raps. And it just nobody understood what he was saying. And so Bill said, I'll go get him out of here. I said, no, I'll go get him. So I walked over, and I said, Charlie, what are you not quite the way I put it, but what are you doing here? Get out of here. Next thing I know, he takes a straight razor and goes, Tsh! and he, uh, I fortunately had a leather coat on, and he cut through that, and I ended up having 32 stitches, two levels of stitches of mine, and I ended up at Baltimore General, which was a real dump. And uh, when I woke up, 
the cops were there. They said, you want to press charges? I said, no, I won't press charges. So I, uh, I said, but I do want to talk to Charlie. And they said, no, 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 your friend already beat him up for what he did to you. So I said, I'm not going to beat him up. I just want to talk to him. Now, this is after I came to faith. So this was in uh, the early 2000s, mm -hmm. I guess. And uh, so I went up, and they sent policemen with me to make sure I wasn't going to beat up on Charlie. And there's Charlie in the prison wing with his hand, hands cuffed and his feet cuffed, his face bandaged up from what Bill had done to him. And I started walking towards him, and he has his eyes just wide open. And I said, Charlie, my face says I've got to forgive you. And he looked at me, he said, you're crazy. Uh, I saw the cops said, being called crazy by a crazy man is probably the ultimate of where you can get. So uh, I rolled on the floor, the stitches hurt, but uh, Charlie uh, decided that he, there was somebody crazier than he was in the place. He, he had you in stitches both literally and metaphorically. Yeah, he did, in both, in both ways. Yes, mm -hmm. right. uh, and there's nothing fun about being cut with a straight razor, I might add. I've never had the experience, never won it. Yeah, you don't know, you don't want it. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't mind actually being a campaign manager sometime. You were the campaign manager for Fritz Mondale in 1984, and uh, he won one state out of the 50. Did you have to remind us of that? So, no, I want, to, I want to remind you of your experience in, the, in a parking lot in Kansas City when, after you had talked with Jesse Jackson, and All he right. goes off, and you're left there. And tell us about that. This is another one. These are, this turns out to be nine lives. Again, this is not superstitious stuff with cats. This is... I'm, I should be dead, the book. Yeah, I, I, I should be. Well, Jesse, uh, uh, Jesse was running for president uh, with Gary Hart against Mondale. And, and, and Mondale, the African-American community, was his logical base. And uh, Jackson was interfering with that. So we went out to the NAACP convention, which was in Kansas City this, in 84. And I wanted to meet with Jackson, who I met with 40-some times in the course of a year, which no human being ought to have to go through. Um, and... Uh, so I get there for a meeting, and Jackson says, come to a fundraiser with me. I said, Jesse, I don't have time to go to a fundraiser. Can't we just sit here and talk and get this over with? He said, no, 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 you come to me with a fundraiser. And these ministers had decided to throw a fundraiser for Jesse in a barbecue joint way up in the ghetto. So uh, we drove up, and out of Kansas City, if you leave downtown, it's very nice, and then it starts to get spottier and spottier. And we ended up in what probably was a wonderful uh, rib place at one joint point, but it was surrounded by public housing projects. And Jesse walks in with me, hardly recognizes the ministers, sits down in a booth with me, and we start talking. And the word went around that Jesse was in the restaurant. So the parking lot got filled with people yelling, run, Jesse, run, Jesse, run. So uh, Jesse said, I want to go talk to those people. And the Secret Service, I thought, fortunately, said, not a good idea, Reverend. We have, haven't had a chance to scope it out. Right? So he said, I'm going to talk to him. So we go out, and Jesse gets on the back of an old dump truck and starts to give one of his speeches. And I mean, I could give Jesse's speech in, in, by, in, in a cold. In, from the outhouse to the courthouse, from the courthouse to the state house, hot time is gone. We take the early bus in the morning, uh, on and on and on. It gets everybody to start going in rhythm on this scene. I'm fascinated by this, right? Because yeah, the guy was a very powerful speaker. So I'm watching this thing, and... I'm just looking at, I had a three-piece suit on, and I, I looked at the crowd, and it was all black. And the next thing I know, I turned around, and there's Jesse's motorcade leaving. I mean leaving. And I had no way to get out of there. So all these black dudes began to surround me, and I tried every ghetto line I knew. You know? <laughs> I mean, I, I, and I, I uh, yeah, probably a couple of insulting ones, but anyway, they were getting closer and closer, and I thought, this is it. It's finally caught up with me. When an arm reached in and pulled me out, and it was one of the ministers. And he said, what are you doing here? I said, Jackson abandoned me. And uh, he said, well, don't feel alone. So he drove me back to the hotel where I, I went to Jesse's suite, and I got Jesse put up against the wall and ripped his suit on him. Um, because? But, huh? You, you ripped his suit on him because why? Why? Because he abandoned me. And the reason, he, the reason that that... that sunk with me was when I was uh, 13, I guess, or 12, 13. Uh, private schools in New England were taking in one poor kid per school as part of their social responsibility. And, uh, and basically, they were all football players, which was I was. And uh, so my father's driving me up to Choate 
which is not hard to find from my house in Connecticut. That's where I grew up. So we go driving up towards Cho the old man exits at Middletown on the river. And I said, Pop, what are you going here for? It chokes up the road. He said, just, I got to stop here for a minute. And he left me in our Studebaker, our old Studebaker, with no heat. It was freezing. It was like January or February. And finally, I got so cold that I went down and walked around all these old bars right along the waterfront. And sure enough, there was the old man in taking shot after shot. And the bartender looked at me and looked at my father and said, I went back to the car, really freezing at this point. I mean, I, I hardly take it. So finally, I went back down. I looked at the bartender, I looked at my father, and the bartender said, took my father's drink away. And he came out in uh, the bar and, and swinging, and he missed, fortunately. Uh, and we get back in the car. He said, now, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You tell your mother that we got lost. That's the reason I didn't make this. And I said, Pop, it's kind of hard to say you get lost. It's right up the road, right? So he said, you just tell her. And by this time, it's snowing, and it's really cold. And two miles from my house, he dropped me off. I had on a sports coat, thin pants, shoes that had holes in them. He said, now you walk home. And by the time you get there, you'll, be, you'll buy into the story that I got lost. So that left an impression on me about being abandoned that, that uh, came f firing back at me when Jackson did that. So, and I do that in the book a lot. I go back to my childhood, mm -hmm. which was a, a very abusive childhood. Um, it's it it kind of a, a strange thing because my father uh, at night would be very drunk and very abusive. And the next day, he'd be very sober and uh, do our homework and do all that stuff. So... But you never knew which one was coming home, you know, and it was, uh, it was very difficult. And he, he didn't take it out of my sister or my younger brother, but he took it out of me. And he had an occasion, if he got particularly mad, to take me to the top of the stairs and just throw me down the stairs. So I bounced down the stairs and told me not to forget it, you know. And then the next day when he sobered up, he'd come in and say, that was a great wrestling match we had last night, wasn't it, Bob? I said, yeah, it was great, Bob, just wonderful. Uh, so... Uh, it was, uh, I couldn't wait to get out of there, you know, when I really couldn't. I was, and I wanted to get out, I wanted to go to politics, and football got me out, got me a scholarship to college, and um, it took years for me to, to come around to getting reconnected with my dad, and who turned out to be a great older dad. I mean, he was mm -hmm. wonderful. But as a young dad, impossible. Um, just a couple other things here. Uh the time you fell asleep at the wheel on the New Jersey, on the New York Turnpike? <laughs> New, New Jersey New Jersey Turnpike. turnpike. Uh, yeah, I don't know if any of you have ever been up to the New Jersey Turnpike, but it's very crowded, and it's four lanes. And uh, I had been at a party in New York in Brooklyn from Friday night until Sunday afternoon. And uh, I hadn't slept a wink because we were drinking and using cocaine. And so I got in the car, and my friend said, you don't want to drive. I said, yeah, I want to drive. So I'm driving down the Jersey Turnpike, and the next thing I know, I hear this pounding on my window. And I look over, and there's this big truck driver. And my car had, I'd passed out, and my car stayed straight. God knows how, but it stayed straight and stopped and backed up traffic for about 20 miles. Uh, and the, the truck driver, as opposed to yelling at me, said, son, you need some help. So I got off at the next exit and got into a hotel and couldn't stay there and then drove back home. And, uh, that was 86, I think, yeah. And that was my first excursion to the AA. I didn't last, but I, I went. You know. Well, there are a couple others here, but I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll skip them because the, the, the point here, I mean, this is it's a very hard life, very hard growing up, very hard life. Uh, how, after all that, if, let's say, someone tells you, after all the experiences with your dad, and someone tells you, well, there's a, there's a father in heaven who loves you. I mean, when you think of father, I'm just curious, how do you, how do you get past that? Well, it was always, it was always a tough uh, dichotomy for me, but I, uh, I know that, that I have a father who loves me. That I have no doubt. And I think my father in his own way, my real father in his own way, loved me. Uh, but, uh, you know, I consider every day since I've been sober a daily reprieve based on my spiritual condition. And uh, I go to AA meetings and I go to church and I pray. You go four, four times a week to AA meetings? AA meetings four times a week, yeah. And um, I have to because if I, if I go out again, I'm never going to come back. So it's, uh, it's a progressive disease. 
<coughs> but um, I figured that God decided he wanted me around for some reason uh, to do something. And so I work with alcoholics, a lot of them, some of whom I can't stand, but I do it. I'm sure I was like that when I was drinking. Uh, but every day for me is a free one. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, uh, when I say I should have been dead, any one of those times I should have been dead. And I thought it was luck that did that for me. But there's only so much luck you can have, you know. And uh, I, it came clear to me in, in, um, after I got sober. And I moved into a farm in Western Maryland. And my friend Cal Thomas, who's here with me tonight, uh, introduced me to a book called The Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And uh, I, because he said to me one day I showed up at, oh, there he is over there. Uh, uh, one day I showed up to do TV with Cal at Fox, and I walked in, and Cal said, how you doing? I said, not very well. And in Washington, everybody says, fine, 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 fine. And we, he said, let's talk after the show. So we did, and he said, you believe in God? I said, no. And this is what year? This was 2001, late 2001, I think. Okay. I had been sober a little bit at that point, and... So Cal and I talked for a long time, and uh, to his credit, he didn't try to push religion on me, he didn't try to uh, push faith on me, but he was a vessel and an important one in my life, who I dedicate this book to. Um, the, uh, so he said, you mind if I send you some literature? And he sent me this first book, which I think is 1,300 pages long. But he was smart enough to know that this was a book that was all about evidence, mm -hmm. you know, real evidence, things you could put your hands on. And I read the thing and I thought, it's amazing how, uh, how the Bible holds up to, to this evidence. And that the Bible itself was the most documented book in antiquity and it is yet to be refuted. You know, there's, there's people who go out and, and try to uh, find reasons for parts of the Bible that are not real. Uh, and and you, you, know, you can argue that back and forth about what people say to me when they heard that I had, had uh, become a believer. My friends, who were mostly drunks and addicts, uh, couldn't believe it. And they would ask me lots of questions, and I'd say, look, um, I can't prove everything that's in the Bible. I have no idea, but I have faith, and my faith tells me that what they say is what happened, and nobody's been able to uncover anything that refutes it. Um, so, but th that was a process. It didn't happen overnight. I mean, I didn't have a burning bush experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I finally, Cal kept talking me into going to church, and I kept saying, if I went into church with my background, the place would fall apart. Um, so finally, he convinced me to go in one day into a church whose congregation is probably 99% Republican, right? And I walked in, and they thought that uh, a prostitute had walked into the place. I mean, the place was shaking. And uh, the, I sat down, and I uh, a little nervous, and this big Welshman preacher stood up and started to give a sermon. And I never much listened very much when I was younger to anybody but myself, obviously. Um, and I have an expression that I have, a few things, just a, a, a sidelight, that I try to remember about my life in the day by day. And one of them is when you're in your own mind, you're behind enemy lines. Mm. And I believe that because your mind talks to you all the time, constantly. On and on and on and on and on. And if you listen to it, it'll invariably get you in trouble, particularly if you're an addict. Uh, and the other one that I try to live uh, to others, one is there's no such thing as a bad day. And in my case, particularly, I mean, I, I look at every day, as I said, a free one. And yeah, there may be things that go wrong in the course of the day, but it, by and large, I'm alive, I'm breathing, you know, I'm being able to spread the word where I can. Uh, so I slowly came to faith, but when I look back on it now, I, I really believe, honestly believe, that there was a power greater than myself in my case, God, the power, the power greater than yourself is what AA uses, so they can attract people who don't necessarily believe in God. I happen to believe it's, it's the Christian God, but um, or the God of all of us, I should say. 
Um, I think that he intervened on my behalf several times. And uh, I thought, if he could forgive me, he can forgive just about anybody, you know. But I don't think he forgives uh, because he picks you out and says, gee, you're a nice guy or you're funny or whatever. I think he picks you out for a job for, to carry on his work. <coughs> and in my case, it's with alcoholics. Um, and going out in the middle of the night and getting somebody out of a drunk tanker, you know, getting, driving somebody up to... I drove a guy up to Karen one day, uh, which is up in Pennsylvania, and I picked him up in Washington, and I was talking to him the last hour, and he didn't say anything. And when I got up there, I realized he was dead. Uh, and so that was a little bit of a problem. Uh, getting him out of the car was a little bit of a problem. Uh, but uh, there have been so many things that have happened that uh, I just don't think for myself that I'm in a position to do that. I mean, I, have, uh, I believe when Jesus said that the, uh, that the only way to the Father is through me, mm. I believe that very much. And I believe that to be born again is to be born again in his light and to have the Holy Spirit in you. And I don't claim to be a, uh, all that articulate on the Bible, although I read it every day. Uh, but I do find some, uh, I actually have on occasion won a couple of biblical battles. But, you know, I, Cal and I went up to uh, Baltimore to see Billy Graham's last crusade. I guess this was four or five years ago. And... Uh, Franklin Graham was there working with him, and so we, uh, Cal had invited up a bunch of heathens from Washington to, to hear this, uh, and so we met with Franklin Graham down underneath the, the stands of, the, of Camden Yards, and uh, so one of the people there said to Franklin, you really believe that, that Christ walked on water, and that he really did ascend when he was crucified? So Franklin looks at me and says, Bob, why don't you try that one? I mean, here's the guy who's the minister, right? I'm supposed to take this on? So I said, well, I guess the closest I could say is that if you took any group of people in Washington, 11, 12, and they all had a secret, and the secret was that what they were saying was a lie, uh, and they all leave and go their separate ways, and people say to them, if you don't admit it was a lie, you're dead. Well, I think about the apostles, and they were, came up in this upper room, and they were scared to death. They were going to be killed, and, and they, they thought they were with the king of the Jews and ended up finding out that, they, that that was not exactly the case. And so they went out into the streets though, the next day and began to preach the word, and I believe Stephen was the first one who was stoned to death. And all of them were martyred, uh, with the exception of John, who went to Patmos. But uh, so I said to him, you know any 11 or 12 people in, in Washington who could do that, who would stand up to that, and the kind of belief you had to have? Well, something happened in that upper room mm -hmm. between the time that they all fled up there and the time that they went back to the streets. And the Bible tells us that, that Jesus appeared and uh, talked to Doubting Thomas and explained the marks on his hands and his, and his legs. And I can't think of another reason why anybody would actually uh, go out and preach the word in the face of persecution like that if they hadn't had uh, an intervention by Christ. And Christ saw hundreds of people after that. Why, uh, and so there's, there is plenty of evidence. Um, the question about the ascendance on the cross, if you think about it, when people ask me about that, I, I say... Um, you know, if we're wrong, that's the heart of our faith. And if that's wrong, one of the greatest cons that's ever been perpetrated on the world, the billions of people, was perpetrated that day. Uh, and I, for one, don't believe that those kind of things can be kept quiet. Of course, mm -hmm. I'm out of Washington, and nothing can be kept quiet in Washington. Uh, but uh, so I think it really... I don't know whether Cal said this to me or somebody, but there was a guy who was a writer who was an atheist who was dying of cancer. What was his name, Cal? Who moved the stone? Who? 
the young, the young guy, the magazine writer. Anyway, uh, he was an atheist, and he debated a number of, of, of people about uh, atheism. And um, it occurs to me that atheism is the toughest thing to defend. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a much easier time defending what I need to defend uh, than they do, because they have, they're, they're assuming that all this happened by some kind of scientific uh, experiment. Uh, and then when you get to talk to people who argue against religion, uh, and you say it all began with the Big Bang Theory, mm -hmm. and I'll say, well, what happened before the Big Bang? And they all come up with this word singularity, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. uh, and they've never been able to define that, but it's... So I, um, uh, I have got to believe that, I mean, who am I to challenge that? Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the things that uh, I find uh, a little imperious about people who, who challenge the faith. Uh, and I said to one of my friends who, who uh, challenged me on it, I said, look, if I'm wrong, then I'll just be a piece of dust and be flying away. If I'm right, I'm going to a better place. Uh, and I hear it more and more from people because they're getting... Uh, they're baby boomers like me, and they're getting to, they start to see the big black wall at the end, and they wonder what happens after that. Um, and in, in many ways, they want to believe, but they just can't bring themselves to believe because society uh, doesn't make it easy to believe, mm -hmm. as we well know. Not to mention all the, the spin off churches that are uh, causing confusion. So you first went to AA in 1985? Way 1986 was when <clears> I 1986. first went, and I stayed sober for two years, and then I went out, and then I came back in for a couple of years and out. And I never, uh, when I finally got it, there's what they call the God steps in AA. Uh, can it come to believe that a power greater than yourself can relieve you from insanity? Um, became open and willing to accept that power in your life. Um, and once I understood that, the rest of it came, I wouldn't say easy, it's not easy to quit drinking. I mean, I was, I was drinking a quart and a half of booze a day and probably doing five or six grams of cocaine a day, uh, which would kill anybody in this room. Uh, but that's another thing, I didn't get into that detail in the book, except that it's pretty obvious that <clears throat> the amount of consumption that I did was enough to kill anybody. Well, the, the docs told you that if you didn't stop, you'd get cirrhosis of the liver yeah, and so forth. Yeah, And my uncle, who was a doctor, uh, my dad's brother, uh, was a doctor in North Carolina, and he got cirrhosis of the liver. And he had a, and it's a terrible way to die. It's very painful. And the liver is a very uh, amazing organ because it would regenerate itself, one of the few that does, until you go over 50% of it and it's cirrhosis and it'll kill you. So my uncle... Uh, got his twin brother to come euthanize him, kill him. Uh, he was a member of the Hemlock Society, and uh, that Uncle Bill uh, disappeared and I think finally died, and they buried him in Ohio or something. But uh, my Aunt Barbara was a, a, a wonderful poet. She, worked, she was with the Algonquin Group in New York, hmm. which uh, none of you will know this, but it was, it was a famous poet gathering every day uh, and she checked into a flop house in, in Hell's Kitchen uh, with a case of gin and drank herself to death at age 36. So uh, it's an insidious disease and um, unless you can get, I, it, it's very difficult to get sober. I don't know of a single person who's gotten sober unless they were not an alcoholic and then they, they thought they were and they stopped drinking. But People who are truly alcoholics, who get sober without faith, I've never run across one. Yeah. So, okay, so, so two pieces of evidence. I mean, there's the evidence of your own life and the lives of others that all the good intentions in the world, all the, all the evidence of how you're heading down the drain doesn't do it. No. Unless there's a change. There's yeah. A... Well, that, you know, that day that I, uh, that I almost, the guy pulled the gun on me in that bar, and I said, if, I, if there's a God, I'll, I won't drink again. Well, I woke up in the uh, insane asylum at George Washington University Hospital in the VIP room, only in Washington where they have a VIP room for, for nuts, you know. 
as if the other people down the hall were just garden variety nuts and I was somebody special. With George W. Bush being inaugurated. With George W. Bush being inaugurated. And I woke up with an unbelievable hangover. And I saw the largest human being I've ever seen in my life. This woman was about six, seven, black, leaning against the door. So I stared at her and she stared at me. And finally I said, you know, you might want to take a walk or, you know, find something to do. She said, if I leave here and your big white butt goes out that window, I'm going to lose my job. I said, well, wh why is that? She said, I'm a suicide nurse. I said, well, who's going to commit suicide? They said, they think you are. I said, not me. I'm no interest in checking out yet. Uh, well, anyway, she stayed around, and then my psychiatrist showed up, <coughs> and he told her to leave, and she probably thought the dementia ward was a much better assignment at that point. Uh, and I said, uh, so here's the day that a, a Bush is being inaugurated, and I said to my shrink, do you hear Texas marching music? <laughs> and I said, maybe I really am insane. And he said, no, I hear it too. So we went over the window, we looked down, I was on the fourth or fifth floor, and all these marching bands from Texas were practicing <laughs> their songs, getting ready for the inaugural parade. So I really wasn't that nuts. And then the next day I went out to Hazleton in Minnesota and I got sober and stayed sober since. Uh, and it has been... Uh, uh, it is, it, after after I, I came to faith, it's not been that difficult. I mean, I don't have a, an urge to to drink. Um, I go on a lot of calls to people who are impossible to deal with. I do interventions, which are very painful. Uh, I did, uh, not too long ago, I had a call from a woman friend of mine whose son uh, had a party in her basement, and there probably were high school kids. There probably were about a hundred of them down there. She said, "I can't get them out. They won't leave. They're all drinking." So I went downstairs and I announced there was a new sheriff in town, and they all looked at me like, "Sure, this is the football team's there, right?" I said, "All right, everybody, bring all your booze up here. We're throwing it away, or you leave." So people brought booze up, and I poured it into the sink they had down there, and I said, "This is not all, but it's got to be here." So I go around, knowing being an alcoholic, knowing full well where I'd hide all my stuff. And I came back in with bottle after bottle after bottle after bottle and threw it out. And these poor kids are looking at this booze going down the drain like this is the last thing I could possibly imagine, horrific. And then there was one very big football player. And I said, where'd you put your booze, son? He said, you'll never find it. I said, I bet I will. He said, you're not going to find it. So I found it. It was in the toilet behind the bowl. You know, we, that's a classic place for us to put those things. And I came walking out, and I poured it down. And he came up to me sort of like he was going to beat me up, you know. And, uh, and I said, son, I've been in, in every cheap bar there is across this country and have been in more barroom brawls than I could ever imagine. And I don't care how big you are, how old I am, you're gone. And that shut him up. Uh, and then they all dispersed because they couldn't drink. But it's things like that, you know, I mean, it's, it's um, I sort of feel like a fireman, you know, uh, a first responder when it comes to drunks. So, let me just ask a couple of questions, then we'll turn to you all for questions you have. Um, just curious, when you present the evidence of your own life, and you know lots of, lots of atheists, lots. when you present the evidence of your own life in the way that nothing worked until you turned to Christ, mm -hmm. And then you also, I mean, to use Josh McDowell's term, you present the evidence that demands a verdict. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they respond? And if some respond positively and want to be in and others don't, do you have any explanation of why it works for some and not for others? Oh, I think it's willingness. I think it's a, uh, a question of where they are in their lives and if, how desperate they are about things. But, you know, I, the, the, the hard thing was that for all those years I was drinking, I was doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. I was making a lot of money. I was being very successful. Had a long, successful career in campaigns. Worked in the White House. Uh, worked in the State Department. And all that time I was at some level. I had alcohol in my system, but nobody knew it uh, because that was normal for me. Uh, and I think that uh, it really does depend on, uh, on the circumstances of their lives that, you know, they say there's no atheist in a foxhole. Well, you know, everybody at one point or another in their lives uh, reaches a point where they know in their heart of hearts they can't do it alone. And they know they don't have friends who are in a position to make it better for them. 
They have friends. You could comfort them, but that's not making it better. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my case, I grew up with a father who was very abusive. And now I have a father who loves me and who I can depend on. And when I need him, I talk to him. Uh, and uh, I don't think I've ever... I can't remember a time when I've been, particularly when I've been sad or something, particularly because of this back operation of mine. It was very brutal, 10 hours on the operating table. And so I got despondent, you know, and I would pray for relief of my sadness. And inevitably it would happen, you know. It, it was, uh, it took time. Uh, and I, after that was over, I didn't exactly know what I was going to do. I still don't, for that matter. But... Uh, I asked him to reveal himself to me because I know he's got a plan for me. Uh, I didn't believe that at first when I, when I was in such terrible pain, but uh, I certainly do now. Uh, and there's been things that have happened, you know, so uh, you never know what uh, he's got in store for you. And uh, all I know is, it, it, is, is that all others saying in AA, let go, let God. Mm -hmm. And I think that's about right. Uh, that in my own hands, uh, I simply can't handle it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll drink uh, more than likely. Uh, and, you know, I also don't much, I mean, people, a lot of people spend a lot of time caring about what people think about them. And when, I, when somebody talks to me, I say in my mind, I care what you think because you're a human being. I just don't care what you think about me. Hmm. Uh, and it's a great relief. I mean, I really don't. And, and believe me, when you're in television, you're a liberal on Fox, you get a few people who disagree with the other thing. But that stuff doesn't bother me. That's earthly stuff, and it's not... Uh, uh, I mean, w w w I've been in politics all my life, pretty much. And the thing that I say in the book is that it occurred to me two-thirds of the way through my political career that I was probably not electing the best people in the world. And that that politicians were not going to fix what's wrong with us. And uh, if we could find faith, um, the world would be that much better place. And I believe that. So. Questions? Over here. Um, they say in Washington, if you want a friend, you should get a dog. Yeah. And yet you've referred to Cal Thomas as your friend. So is that unusual to have a friend in Washington? And well, you know, it's just unusual to have friends that play softball with or something like that or go, you know, out to a movie with. No, it's not. But uh, to have truly friends that will be there for you when you need them most. When I was at the bottom, when I first got sober, the following things happened to me. I was getting divorced. I was out of work. I had been extorted by a prostitution ring, which I didn't do anything except help the police. I had open heart surgery. Um, and one of the first people to come to my aid was sitting right over here, Cal. Uh, and we have diametrically different views about politics. He's wrong, and I'm right, uh, but uh, it's okay. Uh, I abide by him anyway. But, but our personal friendship transcends all that. You know, and uh, I, actually, the thing about if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. I don't trust a lot of dogs, so I'm, I'm a little bit less inclined to do that. Somebody offered me a, a Rottweiler once, and I figured it was a Republican, and that was a reason for that, so I didn't take the, the dog. Anybody else? Well, it's going over there, so I understand you're now pro life. Yes, I am. You were not earlier, right? What, so how did that change? Well, I mean, you can't, you can't come of faith and, and uh, be pro-choice. I mean, you, you know, you, you, it's pretty clear in the Bible um, what, um, what God had intended for us. And um, I used to be on pro-choice boards. And so I quietly, I haven't made a big deal out of it. I've quietly gotten off, and I don't take a lot of time to, to, uh, to talk about right to life. Um, <coughs> I mean, I do when I'm asked to, but uh, 
I just couldn't see the, how I could balance myself with it. How long did you work at Fox News? Seven years. Would you care to comment on the current political campaign situation? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, you know, I've covered presidential politics for, I've either, the first one I did was Bobby Kennedy as a volunteer back in 68 and then did Jimmy Carter's campaign in 76, and virtually all of them I've either been a part of or covered for a network. And I've got to say, I've never seen one quite like this before. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, whatever else you say about Donald Trump, you know, he's the Barnum and Bailey of this century. I mean, he's, uh, he's very good at branding, and he, and, he, and he grabs hold of a message that people uh, feel, a certain segment of the community feels. And uh, when people ask me, who's Donald Trump? And I'll say, who isn't Donald Trump? He isn't a politician. So that makes him acceptable to people. What does he believe in? He believes in anything Washington doesn't believe in, or vice versa. Uh, his time will come, but I'm, I keep reading the uh, obituary of Donald Trump uh, every week, and I Last I checked, he was still on top of the polls. But he, he is, and, and uh, Carson, ben, ben Carson, have dug into this stream of, of, it's not really populism as much as it's just uh, anti-polarization, anti-gridlock. Uh, and so if you think about it, why would they want to go with another politician? They've looked at it, and it's gone nowhere. And they're the beneficiaries of that. The question is, will those people vote? Will they stick with them when they really get down to serious voting? Because that people take their presidential vote very seriously. Um, I don't believe Trump will be the nominee. Uh, my, own, my own preference would be that he would be. I'd, I'd be for Trump and Cruz together. That'd be a good ticket. Uh, but uh, Spoken as a Democrat. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the... Uh, I think Hillary Clinton is um, probably will get the nomination, but uh, simply because she's got more going for her, more money, more organization, and she's been through it before. That matters a lot. But she has um, she is a world class bad candidate, uh, and in fact, all these candidates, with the exception of Trump, uh, I mean, Salmonex sales plummet when these people talk, uh, and. It's, uh, they're just as not an exciting one in the bunch, except for Trump. And he says things that would normally kill a politician, but he gets away with it. And the reason he gets away with it is he's got a Teflon that's a, a sign of the times. This is not the first time this has happened. I mean, you can talk about Ross Perot, you can talk about Huey Long, you can talk about George Wallace, you can talk about a lot of people who've, who've taken advantage of an anti-government stream in the country and tapped into it. This one is a little stronger than I think I've ever seen, and it's got some staying power. And if Trump decides to stay in uh, for any length of time, you may well have a situation where you've got, I've been waiting for this to happen my entire career, a brokered convention. And the reason for that is that, uh, let's say they all, stay, most of the bigger ones stay in. In Kasich's case, he's governor of Ohio. If he runs and stays on the ballot, he wins Ohio, it's winner take all. Uh, if Cruz runs in Texas and he wins, it's winner take all. So all those delegates go in the hands of these people, and you can't put together a majority. Uh, and I'm waiting for that to happen. And if the Republicans try to streamline their pro process, have not done a very good job of it. On the Democratic side, um, it's a lot easier because there's fewer candidates. But can you imagine being the, the 16th and 17th candidate for the Republicans? <coughs> Has anybody heard a word out of Gilmore? Or um, Shapey, or who? Pataki. Pataki, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it sounds like a cheap law firm. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> so I don't know uh, what's going to happen here, except that the, that Trump is not going quietly into the into the good night. That's for sure. He doesn't know how to do that. And if you're Donald Trump, what else are you going to do? I mean, you got your name on everything you could possibly put your name on, even if it's going bankrupt. Uh, it's there, and 
you know, the logical thing is for him to, to run for president in his mind. But now the dangerous part of it is I now think he thinks he can win. At first, I didn't think he thought he could, but now I think he thinks he could. And, he, you know, he looks at his opposition and, you know, doesn't find anybody worthy of his uh, participation. So. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me ask about uh, what's in one chapter, how you helped to get the Panama Canal Treaty passed back in the Carter administration using the very creative use of prostitutes, mm. of copper. Maybe you could just explain how you got those two crucial votes. It's an, it's an interesting lesson about well, Washington work. Uh, I, was at this, I was the youngest deputy assistant secretary of state in history at that point. Uh, and I was given the Panama Canal treaties to do what you all won't remember, but it was, they were very, it was a very big debate in the country about giving the canal back to the Panamanians. Uh, and so I was given that assignment. And I got transferred to the White House to carry it over there. And uh, the president told us who were involved in trying to get the thing passed that I'm not going to make any deals, no Air Force bases, no boats, no anything. I want this treaty to rise and fall on its merits. Well, you needed 67 votes. You couldn't get 67 votes for Mother's Day today in Washington. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we walked out of the first meeting, and I said to Hamilton Jordan, who was his chief of staff, I said, Ham, is he serious? He's going to try to get this thing put through without dealing? And I came out of politics, out of campaigns. We dealt all the time. And he said this, he's been that way since he was governor of Georgia. So I decided that the only way, we, we were about four or five votes short. And I had a guy in North Carolina uh, who was my opposition research guy. And he uh, could find things on people that nobody could find on him. It's amazing. So I gave him a list of five senators. And he said he wanted 50,000 bucks to do it. And that materialized from somewhere. <coughs> I'm not a little careful about that because that's the only question about whether that's legal or not. Um, it wasn't, certainly wasn't legal then, but whether it's statutes or run out. Um, so he came back to me and said, there's this one senator who's got copper, big stores of copper in, in uh, his state, and it's a big deal. But he can't sell any because the Defense Department is the biggest purchaser of uh, copper. And... Uh, so I said, well, let me think about that. So I took, I went up to visit with this senator with the Deputy S Secretary of State, Warren Christopher, and the senator was in shaving with a black tie event, and Chris sat on the toilet and I sat on the, on the heater, and uh, we're talking about the treaties and why it was important. And he said, well, I only have one word for you. And I said, what's that? He said, copper. <laughs> so I said, Chris, why don't you go ahead to the next meeting and let me have this conversation with the senator. And Christopher looked at me because he took the president's admonition seriously. So uh, I went in and talked to the senator and I said, now, Senator, if, if I could get the Defense Department to buy some copper, would you look more favorably upon the treaty? And he had actually hired a retired general to get that lobbying done from him, which was illegal. And I knew that and I told him that. That shocked him. So I, that was the biggest role of my political career. I said, why don't I call Secretary Brown, who's Secretary of Defense, right now and ask her if he'll take send some people out to look at it. So I had prearranged for my secretary at the White House to take my call, and whatever I said just to go along with it. So I made the call, and I said, Secretary Brown in, Bob Beckel from the White House. I'll hold, sure, no problem. <coughs> Two minutes go by, and the senator's looking at me. And I said, Mr. Secretary, how are you? Nice to hear from you. How's your wife? How are your kids? And Mr. Secretary, have you got any need for copper? And he said, uh, <clears throat> no, we got all the copper we need. Oh, that, was, that was the statement they had made before. And I said, well, you know, the uh, Defense Department's always getting accused of paying too much for things. And I know where there's a, a bargain basement run on copper where you can get it. And yeah, that's right, out in this such such a state. And I said, yeah, but Secretary, if you'd send somebody out there, take a look, you'd never know. You will? You'll send somebody out? Great. All the time, my secretary's sitting there, one thought I was going crazy. 
And uh, finally, uh, this is where I rolled the dice. I turned to the senator. I said, Senator, you want to talk to the secretary to confirm they'll send somebody out? And he said, no, 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 you handle that. Now, if he had said yes, I was in real trouble. Uh, so uh, we actually leaked out a story to the, uh, a friend of mine in the paper down in that state that there may be a purchase of copper. And the Defense Department, as usual, said they had no comment. And no comment meant to the paper that they probably were, uh, even though it was a complete, the Secretary had no notion what was going on. Uh, so he ended up voting for the treaty. And the other one was a senator whose top aide was uh, been with him since he was a mayor of a small town. And uh, the senator always listened to this guy before he cast his last vote. And I understood from my opposition research guy that the guy liked to drink a lot and he liked women. Uh, although he was married with two kids and had never strayed but always liked to look. So I called him up and said, why don't you come down to the White House and have a drink? He came down to the White House and he took four fingers of scotch and drank that down, two or three of those passed. And of course, I was, that was no problem for me. So we went over to a, a bar at the old Woolworth Hotel and I never raised the treaty with him, not once. And we were then, women would come to the bar and we'd rate them one to 10, right? One being ugly and 10 being 10. And uh, so we kind of had the same view about women. And so <coughs> I said, we need to do this every week. This is a lot of fun. So we did for like three weeks. And then finally he said to me, Bob, do you know where I could maybe meet a woman? Uh, I hate to do it because of my wife, but I'm really, I got to get this out of my system. I said, as a matter of fact, I do. Uh, so I don't want to give the details. I'll say that for the book. But I, I did call a madam of a place that I knew. And she, I took him over there and uh, he went up and, came back down, came out with a grin on his face, but then he got in my car and he started to cry because he felt so guilty about his wife. And, <coughs> and I said, don't worry about it. The only people who know about this are the two masseuses you were with, the madam of this place and me. Well, the madam doesn't want to get busted. The masseuses are going to get transferred to another place anyway. So don't worry about it. So the next Thursday, we were in the same bar. And in walks my opposition research guy with the two women for the two masseuses. And he looked and said, look at that, Bob, what's going on? I said, I don't know, man. I thought they were being transferred. He says, let me handle this. So I walked up to the th where the three of them were, and I started having a conversation with this guy. And these women didn't speak English anyway. <coughs> they were Korean. And um, so I said, all right, just get them out of here. So they left, and I went back to the table. I said, I don't know what was going on, why she let them out, but... Uh, it's, uh, they'll be transferred tomorrow, so you don't have to worry about it. And sure enough, the next day they were transferred to another uh, massage parlor, and uh, I took him out the next night for a drink, and I said, now, about the Panama Canal treaties, and uh, he was paying attention at that point, since I was the last one to know about what happened, so, and his boss ended up voting for it, so. It's awfully sleazy when you think about it. I'm not proud of it, but it, it, at the time, it seemed a brilliant idea, uh, as too often happens in Washington. So. Anybody else? Uh, one last question. Go ahead. Got back here. Oh, OK. Uh, thank you for coming out, Mr. Bickle. Uh, it's been welcome. very interesting. Uh, you mentioned about uh, some ways that Christ changed your life, obviously, the drinking and drugs. Uh, what other things have you seen change in your life uh, since you came to Christ? And by what means? You've mentioned you read the Bible, uh, your friendship with Mr. Thomas. What other things were involved? Well, I think, uh, if any? I think probably uh, uh, my patience with people and my forgiveness of people uh, is much more, <clears throat> it comes to me much easier. Uh, and love thy neighbor is, is something that, uh, see, I very rarely find a person I don't like. Something, I mean, before I could always find something wrong with them, and now I take Will Rogers' old expression, I never met a person I didn't like. And I try to find the best I can in people, even if I don't want to hang around with them. But, uh, so I think um, that's part of it. 
The other part of it is when I get an opportunity, and I don't, I don't try to push this uh, unless the opportunity presents itself, but I do try to spread the word as best I can and explain my own story. Uh, so, and I, I'm much calmer, you know, I don't, uh, as I said, I, I, I'm alive today, this day, based on my spiritual condition, and it, today is pretty good. Uh, and I should have been dead many times, but I'm not. And I think I, I have an obligation to um, give back to this fallen world what little I can to help it be less fallen. Uh, it's a big job, but you can only do it one person at a time. And uh, uh, I heard the word vessel a lot, and so to the extent that I can be a vessel for somebody to come to faith and come to Christ. Um, I'd like to do that. In my book, I explain very specifically in my chapter on grace how I got through all this. And the message in the book is if I can, if I can get through this and be sober and straight, you can too. There are millions of people out there who come from abusive families who are alcoholics or addicts, not to mention their families. Millions and millions and millions. And <coughs> the lesson here is that, as I said, if I could do it, you could do it. But it was through the grace of God that I was able to do it, through Christ. And um, that becomes very apparent. Because on my own, I couldn't do it. But uh, with faith, I could. So. Um, Thank you all very much. Yeah, I'm very thankful to <coughs> very thankful to God for changing your life, for changing my life, for changing millions of lives. I'm thankful for uh, to Cal for being God's instrument in this particular life. And uh, please join me in thanking Bob for coming tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.